Hey everybody, I'm Tom Peterson with Intel and I'm here today with Tom. Hello. And Tom is one of our video editors here. He does a fantastic job. You're working with video all the time, aren't you? Every day. And have you ever wondered what exactly is going on behind the covers with your videos? Every, all the Every time. Every day. Yeah. Well, uh, today I'm here to tell you guys that we're going to dive deep into what is media and how does Intel make all this stuff work so well, right? All right. So let's dig right in. Let's go. Okay. So first off, what is media, right? Well, obviously media is a sequence of pictures. If you look at this, I'm showing you one frame, but media is actually a full collection of frames and right. also sitting right by it is audio. Mm -hmm. Right, and all this gets packaged up into one file, which is usually called like an MP4 or a, a .movie file, right? Yeah. So the idea is media is a bunch of frames. Mm -hmm. So what is a frame? Well, if you dig in, you'll find that uh, one frame is made up of a bunch of pixels that are mm -hmm. tiny little dots, and each pixel is made up of three colors, typically. RGB. So RGB, right? Red, green, and blue. So you blend those together and you get the color of the pixel. Yeah. Okay, so if you scale that up and say how much data is in a picture, you would say, okay, each color can either be 8 bits, 10 bits, or 12 bits, and that means that each color can have more granularity. So you can have like 16 mil million colors if you're 8 bits, you can have 68 billion colors if you're 12 bits. That's where 10-bit 10, 10 color comes from, and that's why more bits is better color. It takes more storage to store bigger color bits. That makes sense. Now if you multiply it all together, you've got width, time, height, times that color setting, times the number of frames per second, time duration. That's how big things get when you're doing media, right? So if you just apply this formula to some simple characteristics, let's pick 1080p HD, you're 19 by 10, three bytes per pixel, 30 frames per second, 60 seconds, you get 11 gigabytes for one minute of video. You can imagine how big that is, right? Yeah, it gets big really fast. Like, what would you as, just do? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just shooting for Intel Foundry, and we were shooting with the uh, Red Raptor 8K. Uh-huh. Uh, and that about, stores raw format? Raw format, uh -huh. about one hour, yeah, it's like seven terabytes. So one minute is like about 120 gigs. That's crazy. Yeah. So, so it's big. It's big. Okay, media is big. Okay, 155 petabits per second is, is how much data YouTube alone would consume on the internet. That's just basically That's saying if I did 1080p HD on YouTube, and that is 155,000 billion bits per second. That's wow. crazy. Now, uh, as a data point, the entire internet is only 1.2 petabits per second. So YouTube alone would be 132 times the capacity of the internet. Clearly, there's a need for Clearly, compression. Clearly, there's a need for compression. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about how we do it. The idea is that compression always executes in, a, in effectively five phases, and this is called encoding. You take a, a high resolution image and you kind of find ways to reduce it down to sort of a, a smaller file size. These are the steps. These are the steps, right? And there's five and we're gonna walk through them in detail. Okay. Okay, so you can kind of say, uh, through the process of all this, we're gonna get a little bit sciencey, but we're gonna, we're gonna make it understandable. All right, let's break it down. Here we go. Starting off, color conversion. So color conversion is really interesting. In this case, what we're doing is we're looking inside the physiology of an eye. And in there, you'll see there's rods and cones. And the rods actually calculate nothing other than brightness and darkness. We call it luminance. And the cones are actually what sees color, red, green, and blue. Okay? Okay. And now, if you think about it, you are a lot more sensitive to light and dark. You're not as sensitive to color because there's actually a lot more sensors for light and dark. I guess that goes back to like avoiding a monkey jumping at you back in you know, the primal brain, right? Sure. But at the end of the day, we're going to use the fact that you're less sensitive to color and we're going to kind of take advantage of that when we do compression. Okay. And the way it works is typically you think of red, green, and blue making a pixel, but you can also think about it as brightness and darkness and this thing called chroma. And it's just a different way way of recording it. It's completely lossless. It's just a different way of thinking about color. Yeah. Okay? Now the good news is if you did RGB versus YUV, YUV is the color mapping for chroma, luma and chroma, you can see that dialing into that little picture in the middle, the, those yellow blocks, you can either encode it in RGB, but you can also encode it as YUV. No loss of information. This makes sense. Yeah. All right, now the cool part about this is, as I mentioned, they are completely identical. So if I dig into the toucan and I see that yellow region, I would encode it exactly in RGB as that grid there. So it would be a bunch of red on the left, a bunch of black on the right, and then green and blue. Luma looks different, but it's the same information. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can use that to reconstruct. So looking on the left, if you add the red, green, and blue together, you get that yellow grid down at the bottom. Let's call that complexity one. Mm -hmm. Now if you took YUV, you would do white and that magenta thing and that violet thing, combine it together, you get that yellow thing, identical bits, just add them together. Mm -hmm. Now the cool part is we're gonna use a little bit of physiology here. And we've got something called 444, 422, and 420. Mm -hmm. What that's referring to is chroma subsampling. 
sampling. And what that means is we're going to drop some of the pixels from the chroma to reduce file size. So on the first one, 444 means we're using all the pixels, all the bits. What each of those numbers refers to is basically how many pixels are we looking at? That's four, the huh? first four. The second number is how many bits of chroma, how many pixels of chroma are we looking at in the first row? And the second two is how many pixels of chroma are we looking at in the second row? Okay, so now coming down that middle column, 4222, looking at that pink thing, you can see there's really only four colors there instead of eight. Mm -hmm. So we've done subsampling by two, and same with the uh, violet-looking thing, and now we're down to the yellow at the bottom. Pretty cool. We've, you, can, you can see that that 1.5x compression looks nearly identical to the 1x compression. Yes. And we can even go further with a 420 where we drop it down to one, one box, one pixel per chroma, and you can actually see it still does a very good job reconstructing. That's because your eye doesn't see color very well. Love seeing this. I love it. All right, so that's step one, and it's, it's basically going to compress you between 1 and 2x, depending on your subsampling. Now, coming down to the next, it's spatial and temporal redundancy. This is my favorite. Looks and like a huge increase. Massive here. compression, yeah. right? So what happens here is we're looking at a video, and video has a lot of redundancy, right? The, the picture you look at this frame is very similar to the picture you look at next frame. Uh -huh. So how about instead of recording all the data from that second frame, we're going to do what's called uh, motion vector interpolation or motion vector prediction. So it's going to say, like in that case where there's the sun, everything stays the same in the background. So let's just remember that sun moves some distance. And we're going to record that distance rather than recording the sun and recording all the pixels in the background. So you can get rid of most of the data because videos look very similar from frame to frame. Right. Yeah, so you just calculate the motion vector and remember that. It's almost like creating a set of instructions to do reconstruction from a base frame. It's kind of like keyframing. It's, like key, it's exactly like keyframing. Okay. Yeah. We call it iframes and p-frames. iframes are occasionally you remember a full all the pixels and then you do a bunch of p-frames after that to do these predictions. Now the cool thing is um, when you do this predicted frame, it's not perfect because you're doing motion vectors and you're just doing an estimate. So what we do is we take that predicted frame and we subtract it from the original frame and we get what's called a residual, which is all the errors that are left after doing that prediction. Okay. Okay. And the next step of our process in this is called generating decoding errors and correction terms. So that's that subtraction we talked about. You're going to take the original image and you're going to subtract it from this P frame and you're going to get what's called a residual. So it's okay. cool. You can almost think we're, we're done, right? Because now we've got a set of instructions that are like how to construct a P frame and we've got residuals. If we just stored that, you're done. But we can do better. We can actually take those residuals and compress them further. Amazing. Okay? okay, so if you dig into the rest of this process, now you're starting to deal with those residuals because what we talked about in step two, that's basically generating a set of instructions for how to go from a, a full frame to a predicted frame. Okay. What we're doing with the rest of this is how do we make that residual smaller? Okay. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is actually quantizing in the frequency domain. And this is actually a little bit complicated. You ready? Ready. Okay. All right, here we go. And this is a big hitter, 2 to 40x. Yeah, it okay. looks pretty big. So the idea is pretty simple. We're going to take the original image, and instead of storing black and white or colored pixels, we're going to store how much of a particular pattern matches that, and then we're going to give a weight to that pattern. Okay. So looking at that center box, that's a bunch of different patterns. And we're going to compare each of those patterns to the original image, and if it matches a lot, we'll give it a high value. And if it matches a little, we're going to give it a low value. Okay. okay, so the cool thing is we're going to generate a completely different box over there on the right that represents how much of that grid matches. And that's actually doing something called a DCT, which most people think of as a frequency transformation, but it's hard to think about what that is intuitively. I like to think of it as pattern matching. Okay, okay? So DCT is discrete cosine transform. Yes, and, and you're primarily transferring an image from the sort of pixel space into the frequency representation, which is the same as pattern matching this grid. Okay. okay, now the cool thing is, once you've done that, you can do what's called quantization. Now quantization says, okay, I've done this to the entire image, all those little boxes on the right are frequency representations of that same grid. Mm -hmm. How about if I throw out the portions of the frequency spectrum that you can't see? Because mm -hmm. again, I know you're a human. I know you're a human, Tom. I am. And I know that your eyes cannot see high frequencies in the frequency spectrum and images. So yeah. what I'm going to do is throw that data out, sure. and we're going to get compression. That's where this magic happens. Right? Okay. Now, the cool part is, even after quantization, if you do an inverse DCT, which is effectively like how much of each pattern do I recombine, you'll get almost identical image back. 
yeah, the pattern looks very it, similar. It is very similar, and it's again where it's different is in places that you're not going to perceive very often. Okay. Okay. So that's called quantization in the frequency domain, and it's a big part of what's going on with modern compression. Amazing. The last step is called symbol coding. Okay, now symbol coding is when uh, effectively we're doing the same thing that happens when you zip a file. And, okay. and that's called prefix coding. Some, sometimes it's using a method called a Huffman coding, invented by a guy from MIT in 1952. And what it does is things called like run length coding. So what you're trying to do is say, how often does a particular pattern appear? And then we're gonna give that a special code, like maybe one zero means I have five zeros or, or one three means I have 10 ones or whatever. So you're compressing the amount of repeated information. Uh -huh. And by doing that, you're effectively gonna reduce storage dramatically by up to two X. And it's exactly the same as what happens when you zip a file. Okay, great. Completely lossless. Like, why, why aren't we doing this? Yeah. We should definitely do this. Yeah. yeah. So this is the total, somewhere between 600 and 1,000x compression using modern codecs. Unbelievable. All right. So, all right, so let's continue. So now you know how the encoder works. The mm -hmm. decoder works basically the same, but in inverse. Sure. So we're going to take that compressed format on the left, and we're going to go through symbol decoding, then a spatial temporal prediction. So we're basically undoing everything that we did, and you get back to these high-resolution images. And both are, you know, there's lossless techniques, and there's sort of like these expansive lossy techniques. Okay. Now, evolution of media codecs has been massive over time. And what this picture is showing you is that maybe it started around MPEG-2 time in 1996. This right. was like, DVDs. you just started DVDs, right? Yeah. And it's gone all the way through H.264, VP9, H.265, and AV1. And during that process, the compression ratio has gone up dramatically. You can see each generation, different techniques have resulted in higher and higher compression rates. Yeah. Now, uh, the bottom line is actually telling you complexity. So if you had a software encoder, it would take 100 times longer to do it on AV1 versus the original MPEG-2. So that says these algorithms have gotten a lot more sophisticated, they're looking for a lot more redundancy, but they're also a lot harder to run. And that's why we've built the hardware to accelerate that directly. All right, so this is a great time to take a break, Tom, and I wanna see what you've been working on, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about how these concepts map to your workflow. Love that, let's All do right. it. All right, so Tom, what have you been working on lately? Today, we're working on a short social clip that details Intel Arc GPU. Oh, perfect. And it's a welcome to creators. We're ready. Come use us. Do all that media stuff you do. That's right. Very exciting. And what did you shoot it on? We shot it on the Canon C70, okay. which is a Super 35 sensor camera. Okay. And shot it at HEVC 422. Okay. So uh, high quality. High quality. Really good color. 4K. Okay, great. Well, now what am I looking at on the screen first? What is this showing me? This is Adobe Premiere Pro, right? That's right. So here we are in Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, and we it's are- It's running on an A750. That's right. This is a beautiful, beautiful PC. Beautiful PC. Uh, it's been really fun to play with this yeah. over the last couple of All right, so days. back to Adobe Premiere Pro. What do we got here? Uh, so right now we have a sequence here of shots. And this bottom section looks pretty complicated. What, what am I looking at on that bottom? Yeah, section? so this is a timeline here, and right now it's a string out of different clips, okay. and what happened was I got a bunch of clips uh, from the studio team when they were shooting this okay. uh, a couple days ago, and uh, the first thing I did was I wanted to cut it all up because I, I can't work with one clip, right, I have right, to have right. multiple shots, right? Okay. Um, so instead of going in and doing this by hand, I just did a, a scene edit detection. Okay, and scene edit detection is pretty cool. It's an AI algorithm that runs in Adobe, and the way it works is it reads the file in, to, and it uses our hardware decoder to read it real quick, into that raw, uncompressed format. That raw data is actually transferred over to our XE core, actually on our RK750, uh -huh. where it uses our XMX blocks to run an AI algorithm, right? Pretty cool. So it's media engine, it's AI engine, it's all coming together, just beautiful. And then at the end, it detects all these cut points and writes it into your metadata. Yeah, I was going to say it's a super handy tool to have. Oh, it's, it's, it's a super handy tool. I yeah. love it. All right. Once I get the shots cut out with AI, I start building my timeline, building my sequence okay. of the video. And so this is like where you're doing your creative process, right? Yeah, this is like kind of my canvas where I can kind of try ideas out, audition different shots, put things together. Nice. See what works. Okay. And you said you're using filters. What do you mean when you say you're using a filter? I'm applying filters to enhance the footage or speed up, slow down the footage, sometimes okay. crop. Okay, Masking. but just sort of like any change to a to a, a, a video, you, you call that changing thing a filter. That's right. Okay, what's the first big filter you're using here? The filter on this that we use mostly is stabilization. Okay. 
That's a filter you can apply to smooth out shots. So in this case, I happen to know the image stabilization is also running the, on the ARC A750 XE core. This time it's running a compute shader and it's getting the data again read from the decoder. It goes straight into GPU memory, it manipulates it, kind of smooths it out, then it writes it back out. So it's a very cool use of both the media decoder and the XE cores. And definitely approves the quality of the shots. For sure, for sure. Okay, once you get your shot set up, you got your timeline where you like it, what's the next step? The final step is exporting. Okay. And What's that look like? We'll just do a command key here of Control M. Okay. Uh, go into export. We're going to be exporting at HEVC H.265. Okay. We're going to go full res. Okay. Here and, and click export. Yeah, Let's click go. Export. Let's go. All right, so it's running really fast, and this is where all the magic comes together, right? Everything is being read, decoded, mid middle uncompressed data, doing the AI on that data, then back through our encoder, and you get a file at the output, right? That's right. So now we got a high res. 4K you, you're output. Pulling that back in. I'll pull it back in and we can watch it here. I'd love to watch it here. All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Going full. Oh, yeah. I think I'm biased, but I love it. I, I know I'm biased. Arc safe. Oh, yeah. I can, I can actually see. Oh, there's the stabilization filter. Yeah. All right. I like it. Ah, welcome. Here Creators, we welcome. So what do you think? Really cool. Thanks for showing me that. Now, uh, I think the fact that that export went so quick is all because you're running on that Arc GPU over there, right? Most definitely. Yeah, so let's spend a little time talking about how we go from codecs and like compression to what we do inside our GPU for codecs. Okay. Okay? So digging right in, we have built what's called a media engine. And that media engine is responsible for doing everything we talked about. It does the encoding, it does the decoding, and it does it all in hardware. It's kind of crazy. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, right? And it's present both in our Intel Arc GPUs and in our Intel Core Ultra CPUs with built-in Intel Arc GPUs. Love it. Now, it all breaks down into a pretty simple idea, right? Same media engine practically is in both blocks. And on the Meteor Lake SKUs, it does 8K60 10-bit HDR decode. And on the Alchemist or the uh, Arc 750, it does up to 8K60 12-bit HDR decode. So really high performance, low power decoding and encoding on both our CPU and our GPU. Now, you might say, how does it do it? How does it do it? <laughs> How does it do it? Wait, tell me more. So we take our MFX engine and it basically implements in hardware all those blocks we talked about, right? Okay. So it's got a, a dedicated hardware block for ENCODE doing the color space conversion, the spatial temporal stuff, all the way through the frequency conversion, the quantization, then the symbol ENCODING. Mm -hmm. And it does the inverse on the decoder side. So all of that block logic is built into the IP. Nice. Pretty cool. It makes perfect sense. Now, if you think about it, we can do ENCODE. But remember how I told you ENCODE is kind of interesting because we, we do that color space conversion, then spatial and temporal redundancy search, where we're looking for blocks to replace, and we generate that instruction stream. Uh -huh. Well, we have to calculate the residual when we're doing it, you know, that, that ENCODING. Right. The way we do it is we take all those instructions and we send it to our decode block. Right? So the decode block generates those P frames and then does the subtraction with the original frame to calculate the residual. So our encoder is actually tightly connected to our decoder. Seems more efficient. Yeah, it's very efficient. And at the end of the day, we get that, that residual that we then press through our quantization and our symbol coding. I'm learning. Oh, you're learning. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the decode is very similar. We take our compressed data and we put it into the symbol decoder all the way forward through. Things are getting bigger, we're getting fatter. And finally, you end up with the uncompressed, beautiful RGB image. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. Yes. We also do what's called transcoding. Now, transcoding is mostly what Adobe's doing. But if you think about it, they're reading the source, whether it's low, you know, whether it's AVC or HEVC or whatever it is, they're reading some encoded data that you captured with a camera, and it's going through our decoder. And then it lands in the middle in uncompressed data format. In that uncompressed format, that's where we do all of the filters. So you might do an AI programming running on our systolic array, or it could be doing a filter on compute. But all of that filtering and stuff is happening in that uncompressed space. And then when we're going to the export side, it'll recompress it using another dedicated MFX block. That's right. All right, so transcode is cool, but we actually have two MFXs. So we can actually do what's called dual MFX encode. And in a case like ProRes, where we don't have dedicated hardware support for decode on ProRes, that'll actually be run on the CPU. And that frees up both MFX blocks to do encode. So in that case, we can actually split the stream using a, a group of frames idea. And we run half of the decode or half of the encode on one MFX and the other half of the encode on the other MFX in parallel while we're doing a CPU decode for ProRes. 
and that means you can get the ProRes behavior dramatically faster. Great. So summarizing all the hardware, it's very programmable, but it does very efficient fixed functions for the encode and decode. But you got to have software to drive it. Sure. And so this stack is showing you all the software investment that Intel does. And it, it really does start at the application level where our AEs are working with the application, application developers all the time. And you'll see they have some, some choices of middleware that they're going to use. So they can either use FFmpeg mm -hmm. or GStreamer or HMFT, which is the Microsoft way. So if you're, if you're doing a movie player on Microsoft, mm -hmm. you're, they're going to be using HM, I'm sorry, HMFT. And then you can also use VPL or D3D directly because these uh, APIs now support media as well. So the way I think about this is, you know, at the very high level, you might do, please decode this file, that kind of call. It's very high level, very abstract, and you have lots of choices of the API you can use. Sure. But all of them talk to these runtimes. And the runtimes are responsible for doing some simple things like memory management, maybe a little bit of multi-threading. But very quickly, they make calls that are also very high level down to our driver stack. So our driver stack, the media UMD, the KMD, that stands for user mode driver or kernel mode driver, they're responsible for translating those commands into setting up and controlling our media engine. So depending on the codec format, depending on like the bit rates, you'll configure our blocks differently. And that's all responsibility covered by those driver stacks. Great. That's yeah, pretty cool. So if you add that all together, we get performance, right? We've got dedicated hardware. We've got an efficient software stack. What do you get, right? Well, this is telling you transcode time. And transcode time is a fairly standard way to benchmark media performance. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, we're doing a six-minute clip, and we're trans transcoding from 4K UHD to 1080p. Okay, that's how a lot of people are doing this stuff today. And uh, the output is 1080p. It's six minutes long. It's 40 megabits per second. Great. Okay. Now it takes approximately 28 seconds to do that process on Handbrake. It's super fast, right? Now, if you look at uh, Premiere Pro, it's a little bit longer, 29. Uh, I'm sorry, 59 seconds. But the reason it's slower is because Premiere Pro is organized primarily for content editing. Mm -hmm. It's got a whole editor session in there, and they have different ways they manage data. Mm -hmm. uh, Handbrake doesn't deal with any of that stuff, right? So Handbrake's going to be as close to the metal as it can be. Now, if you looked at a750, really, really fast. But the interesting part is that Core Ultra is also super fast, mm -hmm. right? Handbrake is approximately the same speed, very low level, you know, programming directly on our hardware. Yeah. As you get to the bigger stacks, you're dealing a little bit more with memory management. And, and sometimes you can be compute limited. So in this case, you know, you'll see uh, the Intel Core Ultra has fewer uh, XE cores, which means it'll be more compute limited than our ARC A750. Great to see CapCut being used yeah. super fast. Yeah. Uh, rendering so, six, a six minute clip? Um, I mean, less than a minute, less right? Less than a minute. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. Now, I don't normally like to talk about competition, but I can't help it because we're so good. Let's talk. So this is uh, comparing against the RTX 4060, and this is normalized to 4060. So 1.54 means that we're 1.5x performance on Handbrake. So if it takes you a minute to do it on us, it'll take a minute and a, and, and a half to do it on NVIDIA. It's a crazy. It's 50% faster than NVIDIA. Unbelievable. And it, even if you look at all the other applications, some are going to be faster, some are going to be slower. But overall, we are totally ready for any media processing today. Love it. If you go forward and you compare our integrated graphics, you'll see that the Intel Core Ultra is sort of smoking the Phoenix Core. So this is showing you the Ryzen 7 Pro 7840U, and you can see Handbrake is 3.5, 3.6 times as fast. Wow. It's crazy. And all the other apps are pretty much faster, so I would call this a solid win for Core Ultra over Phoenix. Looks like a win. Yeah, very good. Now, if we come back, right, I've shown you, or you've shown me, running on the Arc A750. Yep. What I want to do now is I want to take a look at our Meteor Lake SKU and see how it performs there. Okay, great. All right, we're here with Ryan, who works with us here. He's helping us today. Ryan, what have you been up to? So, while well, you and Tom have been recording, I've been doing some recording myself. And what have you been recording? B-roll. B-roll, baby. Yeah. All right, so what do you got set up here? So. I just have a, a number of clips that I took while we were recording, uh -huh. and I, we're going to go ahead and just look at what I got. All right, so this is stuff that you just recorded. What did you record it on? I recorded it on a phone. On a phone. That's right. Okay, so this is sort of a typical use case. You've got a phone. What did you record the format in? It was a 4K, 30 FPS, and HEVC. Okay, awesome. And, right. and you've got a timeline that you created in Adobe. So as you scroll back and forth, you're just sort of perusing the timeline, right? But after you do all your editing, what's the major function you have to do at the end to get rid of, you know, to generate the movie? 
Yeah, in order to get it at the end, we need to export. Okay, and export is basically the way you can really tell how the performance is on this. So let's go ahead and go to the export screen, and what do we do? Okay, so we have a little hotkey here, Control M, and it'll take us right to export. Okay, fantastic. And here are all of our export settings. Okay, I see you've got a 1080p output, and you're using H.265, and it looks like you've got that 4K input. So let's go, give it yep. a shot. We're gonna kick it out into 1080p, make it more uh, easily accessible. All right, so cool. That, that's the ex, that's the timeline of, of the export. Now, what's happening is the uh, the media engine is doing all the decode. All these clips are stored in memory inked and encoded, and they're being decoded in real time into that uncompressed format. And then our encoders are kicking on to generate the final image. Right. So that was pretty quick. That was about how long? About 15 seconds. About 15 seconds. So a 30 second clip 4K to a 15 second e export time. We got a, a 30 second uh, 1080p clip. That's really cool. It's faster than real time. And it's on an Intel Core Ultra Notebook. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it. You got it, Tap. Well, that was pretty cool, right? That was great you to see. You saw the demo, an Intel Core Ultra Notebook running a media transcode on Adobe Premiere Pro, and it did it in 15 seconds. Right, with built-in Intel Art with graphics. With built-in Intel Art graphics. Thank you very much. Yep. Now, I want to say, it seems like we're all about media, and we are, but I want to recap all the rest of the stuff we've been doing this year. Sure. Okay, bring everybody up to speed. So we've had more than 30 driver releases since launch, and wow. the drivers are how we keep making uh, Intel Arc better and better and better. We've had more than 72 game on drivers, which means that the day a big title comes out, our engineers have already optimized the driver, and it's going to be great on the day you launch the a game. Yeah. We have more than 100 games that have integrated XCSS. You know, XCSS is our super sampling technology using AI, course, yeah. and it takes a tremendous effort by our AE team and also our dev rel team to get the buy-in by the community. But the good news is people love XCSS. Yes. It's in a more than 100 titles. But the big thing is that our performance gets better almost every week. You know, we have more titles that are optimized. We've re-architected our DX9 driver. We've re-architected our DX11 driver. And now we're getting closer to the performance of where Arc 750 should always have been. So I'm pretty excited about the work that Andrew's team and Alex's team have done. It's, it's really delightful delivering on the goods. Nice job, guys. Yeah, good job. All right, but now we know media is a big part of this too, right? There's yes. media video editors, there's video playback, game streaming, and even movie streaming. So many, many use cases, and we're committed to all of them. If you think about what I talked about today, we have a great media stack. You know, Charlie's done a great job on the architecture. James has helped a ton. And it's easy for applications to use Intel Arc Media's engine, right? We also have leadership IP. That, that IP has been developing over the last 20 years, start off with Quick sync, and now it's just even better. We support all major media applications. You saw Adobe Premiere Pro here. Mm -hmm. We do Handbrake, just crushes the bare metal. And lastly, we're going to continue to make media performance even better through driver updates. Good. So, wow. Yeah. We love media. Use it every right? day. Yeah. So, thanks for being here, Tom. This has been fun. Yeah. Thank you. And I want to say to you guys uh, go to game.intel.com. You'll see more information there. Tom and I will be back talking more about tech, but I can say uh, right away thanks for being here, and we'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye.